Okay, so let's let's move forward to a situation where one one of the things you saw in that graphic analysis, which again I really like, is you had the data for concentration at all these given times. Okay, you can use concentration data to calculate KEQ, or you can use KEQ to calculate concentration, and the deduction or deducing of equilibrium concentration is known as utilization of an ice table. Those of y'all who've been here before, who've seen this stuff before, you kind of know what an ice table is. Ice tables are something inherent to this chapter and you have to be able to maneuver and utilize properly. So, they give an example and we're going to walk through the, the PowerPoint example first, then we're going to do mine because the PowerPoint example is, is there's multiple different uh, problems you can get with an ice table. So the key to the ice table is to tabulate all your known concentrations, whether it be initial or equilibrium. What we are not taking into consideration and we really don't care about is, again, we don't care about how long it took to get there. We are just saying, hey, our system is at equilibrium or it is not. For anything that you know the initial and equilibrium concentrations, you can then calculate a change using the stoichiometry of the balance equation you need to find the change for all constituents of a chemical reaction and then you need to be using the initial and the changes to find and fill in the rest of the table essentially. That's what they're saying here. So once you have done that, you can calculate equilibrium constants using the deduction or the math that you have figured out. So what they have given us in the PowerPoint is this situation. They say a closed system has one mole, one e to the three, so we got one e to negative three molar, H2, two e to negative three molar, I2, and at equilibrium they have told us that we have 1.87 e to negative three molar HI. All right, so the problem has told us all of this. The problem wants us to find Kc, Keq, at a given temperature, for the reaction of interest in this case, which is H2 plus I2 creates hydroiodic acid in the gas form. So, the ice table is structured like this. Initial change and equilibrium. So, that's where the ice comes from. Initial I change C, equilibrium, E. And you don't have to make it into boxes. You'll generally see me on my reference and uh, answer keys. You're going to see me write it like this. I don't usually use the lines. But you separate this in columns as a function of reactants and products. So they tell us in the problem that we have started and we have an initial concentration of 1 e to the negative 3 and 2 e to the negative 3. Sorry, I needed to write that. It should be a 2 there for the balance chemical equation. If we are talking initial, whenever you see initial, unless otherwise stated, initial means no reaction has occurred, okay? Which means that we should be dealing with a zero concentration of hydroiodic. Remember that for this chapter. When you hear initial, that language, initially, we are talking about reactants only. No reaction has occurred yet. Now, if you have been given a mixture, a little different, but in this case, initial, zero for the products. At equilibrium, they have given us, based on our data, that we have 1.87 e to the negative 3. Again, remember, all of these are in molar. I'm just not going to be writing the units for all of this. We should know that. Okay. So, from a deduction standpoint, right, we have been given enough information to fill in one of these empty boxes. And the empty box that we can fill in is which one? Right, the change of products. If we started with zero, 
and the day and the problem tells us you have this much, then what does this change have to be? Right, right. The total change has to be, this value has to be 1.87 e to negative 3. And in what direction? That change should be a positive or a negative change? Should be a positive change, right? Should be a positive. So what you're going to see about that, that row change, you're always going to want to have a sign there, positive or negative. Okay. But what we have to take into consideration comes back to this idea and concept of relative rates, stoichiometry. This too is very important to us because algebraically, let's take a look without putting this 1.87 there. Algebraically, the change can be shown like such. Since we have a understood one here, the change of H2 to create products means that we are taking the amount that we started with and we are subtracting the amount that is going to be converted. So we got 1 times 10 to negative 3 minus x. That x is a placeholder, it's a variable of how much. This I2 is 2 e to the negative 3 minus x. And the change here algebraically should be represented as plus two x. All right. Well, let me let me not write this part. Let me let me just try to show this simple. Initial is there. The change is minus x. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Change here is minus x. Change here is plus 2x. The variable and the coefficient or the, the multiplication of the variable is a function of the stoichiometry. Notice that we got a plus and a 2x. Which means that 0 plus 2x has to equal this amount. Therefore, if we were to specifically know x, we need to use this math here. But to fill in the rest of the table, this down here should be 1e e to negative 3 minus x, 2e e to negative 3 minus x. And this value should technically be 2x. So therefore, these two have to equal one another. So we've been given this information. In all the different types of questions you're going to see on equilibrium, you may be given some, all, none, initial, change, you need to just be able to utilize this tool, which is the ice table. So therefore, x in this case has to be equal to what? 1.87 e to negative 3 divided by 2. And what is that value? 0 0.9 no, got to be smaller than that, right? Yeah, right. Nine point three five times ten to the negative three. Four. Four. Yeah, four. All right. So x is nine point three five times ten to the negative four. Then, if we do the math here. What do these values end up equaling? 1 e to the negative 3 minus point. So it's 1 minus 0 0.9, essentially. 0 0.9. 1 e to the negative 3 minus 9.35 e e to the negative 4 or 
6.5e to the negative 5. And here. Let's say 1.1 times 10 to the negative 3. And this value, right, which is where we get, which is what we are concerned with, right? So the equilibrium values that we're concerned with are here. Now they do the math here, and they show you these values instead of showing you the x, but I wanted to show you the general format because you're going to need that general format moving forward. So. These are the three values that we just came up with, the at equilibrium values. So the at equilibrium values for each constituent of our reaction. And they have asked us at this temperature to calculate KEQ or KC, and that is being done using these. Remembering the stoichiometric is in effect, K equals products 1.87 e to negative 3 squared all over 6.5 e to negative 5 times 1.1 e to negative 3. K equals, or KC, KEQ, it's up to you. I generally just use K unless I'm dealing with pressures, and they show you that this value is 51. Again, they told us at a given temperature, so look at this, temperature, 448 Celsius. We're talking about 700 degrees Kelvin. We have a K of 51. What does this K tell us about the reaction? Lies to the right. Products are favored. We should see a larger amount of products than we do reactants. And you see that here. So it should hold true mathematically all the way through. Um, now let's take a look at, at the worksheet. Any questions about this? This is a situation where they gave you equilibrium concentration, right? They gave you equilibrium concentration. Now I'm going to give you the example where it's the opposite. I'm going to give you an example where you need to use KEQ to calculate, all right? And again, this is just going to take, because of time, right, I can't go over every single type of problem, but that's where the supplemental and the homework comes into play. But this is the opposite type of situation. So in this situation, I gave a uh, ice table, I kind of wrote it for you already, but CF2H2, so CF2H2, gives you carbon plus hydrogen gas plus fluorine gas. Decomposition reaction. And I ask you to fill in the table. All right, so now here's an ice table. And you're going to see me from now on just write ice. And I gave you that this is 2, a 2 times 10 to the sun. 2e to the negative 3. So I started with 2e to the negative 3. And since we're dealing with initial situation, you should have 0 here. Okay? You should have 0 here. Now, the change, the change in our reactant for a forward moving reaction should be what? Negative 3x. Negative x. Negative x. Stoichiometric coefficients are all 1. Therefore, minus x. What about the change in carbon? Should be plus x. Hydrogen, it's also a product being formed, plus X. 
And then fluorine plus X. <clears throat> Okay, therefore at equilibrium, what should we have? At equilibrium, our concentration of our reactant should be what? It's the summation of initial and change. So we're dealing with 2 e to negative 3 minus x. At equilibrium, we should just have x, we should just have x, and we should just have x. Now, if this is looking like what the heck is going on, you need to stop now, we need to clear this up. For real, because if not, you, this whole chapter is going to be, this actually the next three chapters are going to be a wash if you don't understand what's going on right here. Because of stoichiometric interactions between molecules, these values have to be related, right? Law of conservation of matter. You cannot create products without using up reactants and vice versa. So therefore, that X is a placeholder. Algebra, this is where this unfortunate lack of, you know, the algebra knowledge across most of your disciplines, this is why this is a little confusing to you. You have to form a stoichiometric relate, rel rel related, excuse me, amount. In this case, we have ones everywhere. It's very simple. I did that on purpose. Now, if we wanted to look at the equilibrium expression for this given situation, what does KEQ look like? What is the KEQ or KC expression for this reaction? Concentration? Concentration H2, concentration F2, all over C, F2, H2. And like I said before, everybody that uses that and writes that is going to be wrong. Why? Carbon is not involved in the equilibrium expression. It is, a re it is a product, but it is a solid, which is why you have to pay very close attention. Make sure that you are double checking all of your work. So KEQ is actually H2 times F2 over C, F2, H2. Concentration. Hopefully we are all clear there. Which means that this entire column on our ice table is irrelevant, right? We don't need it. You can put it in there if you want to, but you don't want to trick yourself into ending up having an expression that doesn't work. Okay. Now we're going to move into the mathematics that most people are uncomfortable with. And that involves relating the ice table equilibrium values that we have formed as a function of the chemical reaction and plugging those into KEQ, which means that KEQ now is equal to what? No, no, no. I'm talking about expression-wise. Concentration of X times concentration of X over 2, 2 e to the negative 3 minus x. And now we have a KEQ expression that we have plugged in equilibrium concentrations for. OK? Now, on your worksheet, I have given you the equilibrium constant. 9.07 times 10 to the negative 6, which means that we can set this expression equal to that, which means that 9.07 times 10 to the negative 6 is equal to x squared all over 2e to the negative 3 minus x. 
Hopefully we get there. All I did was plug in the value for KQ. So in this situation, we are not calculating KEQ from equilibrium concentration. We are going the reverse. We are using KEQ to calculate equilibrium concentrations. Now, anybody familiar with this problem right here? This is considered a what? What is this going to turn into to be able to solve it? This is a quadratic equation, all right? So, those of you all with a calculator, particularly a graphing calculator, you can utilize graphical analysis to answer this. I have a video on D2F about using the calculator to solve equilibrium quadratic expressions. I will take a, go take a look at that. But if you did have to use a quadratic equation, the old-fashioned way, you can do that old-fashioned way, no issues. You can do that on no issues. But what you must do, right, is multiply both, multiply both sides by this. You end up with uh, what looks to be x squared minus Uh, sorry, plus 9.07 times 10 to the negative 6 x. Well, let's, let's just use e because I just it just makes more sense. X minus whatever that product is, 1.8 e to the negative 8. 1.8 e to the negative 8 equals 0. Now, um, I'm going to plug it in real quick. You can use, uh, go watch the video on how to, how to do this, but you can set one y equal to 0, and you can set the other y equal to this equation. So you get uh, x squared plus 9.07e to the negative 6x minus 1.8e to the negative 8. You can graph it. And remember, when you're dealing with a quadratic, sometimes you have a negative root, right? And one of those negative roots is not going to be something that you can utilize. Why? Because you cannot have a negative concentration, right? You can't have a negative amount of something in chemistry. You can have a change that's negative, but a negative concentration doesn't occur. So second calc 5 gives us 1.29e to the negative 4. So if x is equal to 1.29e to the negative 4, then this is a value that can now be placed in x. And so the answer to the question, which was fill in the table, calculate the equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products. Here is the concentration of H2 and F2 in molarity, right? So this equals concentration of H2, which equals concentration of F2. They should be the same. They are stoichiometrically the same. And then concentration of C, F2, H2 is equal to 2.5. 2e to the negative 3 minus 1.29e to the negative 4. So that value that goes into the table is equal to 2e to the negative 3 minus 1.29e to the negative 4. Uh, uh, 1.87e to the negative 3. So 1.87 e to negative 3. And now we do have units here, right? Because now we're talking concentration. So remember, when we talk concentration, you need units. Now for those that are like, how did you get from here to x? This is solving the quadratic equation, either using a quadratic formula. I think I do it the old school way in one of the videos. And I think I do it using the calculator. So realize that if you have been given a quadratic, or you end up with a quadratic, then you are going to have to go through this process one way or the other, right? One way or the other. Now, you will not be given any question that involves having a cubed root or x to the fourth power because you will not be able to solve that with your current math skills, right? It's, it's just not. 
It's not something that any of us can do. I can't even do. But this is how to calculate equilibrium concentrations given KEQ. You can also calculate initial concentration, right? So any given question from here, what if I gave you all of these equilibrium concentrations and ask you for initial? If you had KEQ, you can do it. All you need is the expression, right? All you need is the expression. And then you're solving for this guy, right? This becomes your new X, or you can call that Q. I'm not Q. You can call this Z. You can make it whatever variable you want to. But I mean, I'm gonna hopefully be able to get some, you know, some opportunity to add to my um, workout Wednesdays for equilibrium because there's a lot of there's a lot of different stuff. We got questions? Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? This is this is a very important methodology that you have to be able to do. You will definitely see a question that involves going through this process, whether it be two reactants, one product whether it be one reactant, three products, whether you need to be able to determine solids and take it out of the equation, a lot of people are gonna get stuck because they're not gonna remember that. And then they're gonna have X cubed and they're gonna be like, what the hell is going on? Okay? All right, everybody got this written down because I'm gonna we're gonna go to uh, part C. All right, so part C asked about what is KP? All right, well, we were given that KC is equal to, what, I, what was it, 9.07 e to the negative 6. All right? We know that the KP equation equals KC multiplied by RT delta N, where N moles of products minus N moles of reactants. And if we do delta N, we see that we're dealing with two moles of gaseous products and one mole of gaseous reactants. Therefore, delta N equals one, right? And anything raised to the first power is itself, right? So we end up with KP in our situation is equal to KC RT and I needed to get, I, I needed to give you a temperature here so let's just say we were dealing at a uh, hundred Celsius so therefore we're dealing at 373 Kelvin Right, you need a temperature here. So, Kc, 9.07 e to negative 6 times the gas constant. And in our case here, the gas constant that they ask you to use is uh, I think, I'm pretty sure that you use Joules, let me verify. This is one of the few weird ones where you cannot deduce via units. I want to make sure that I'm telling you right. Um, they use for KP, So they do use a liter atmosphere of Kelvin mole. So in, in all cases of KP, we're going to use 0 0.0821. Liter atmosphere Kelvin mole. And I'm pretty sure the reason that they use this instead of the energy one is because we're dealing with gaseous molecules. For us to be concerned with this transition, it has to be something that has a partial pressure, right? So you will not see KP, KC, Conversions 
for aqueous systems, right? Because we're not dealing with partial pressure. And then this is multiplied by 373. Kelvin. Now, remember, KP also does not have any units, even though our KC value doesn't, right? The units, this is one of the weird ones where the units don't work out the way they uh, should, if you will. But KP also is unitless like KC. So uh, we have 9.07e to the negative 6 times 0 0.0821 times 373. And we see that KP in this case, 2.7e to the negative 4. So KP and KC are not equal in this case. Tell me something, is there a situation where KP and KC will be equal? How do you get KC to be equal to KP? Right, delta N has to be zero for that to occur. So you have to have the same number of moles of gas on each side, then KP is equal to KC because delta N is zero, anything raised to the zero power becomes one, KC is equal to KP. But, you know, you'll run across a question like that. All right, given these two values, KP and KC, what can we say about the direction of the equilibrium? Where does it lie? To the, to the left, right? We got values lower than one. So the equilibrium lies to the left. All right. Next question. Making the container smaller would shift the equilibrium in what direction? Now we got to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of Le Chatelier's principle. So before we answer that question, we know that it lies to the left based on the value. Let's talk about the idea of what would happen if you mess with the system at equilibrium, right? So all of us, you know, it should make sense in, from, a, from a, just a, a generic situation standpoint, right? If somebody was pushing me this side, right, then I'm gonna probably lean a little bit back this way to account for that. Chemical systems do the exact same thing. They adjust to reestablish equilibrium. If everything is moving towards equilibrium, the things that a chemical system does are to reachieve equilibrium. So Le Chatelier's principle is a system at equilibrium is disturbed by a change in temperature, pressure, or concentration. The system will shift the position to counteract the effect. Okay? So three things. Delta T delta P or change in concentration. So in the very first example on that graph, right, we said stuff like take out CO, put in CO, let everything else out. Those were changes. Now we hadn't said anything about Le Chatelier's principle, but now we're gonna focus specifically on what would occur if we did certain stuff. And I, I don't like their, uh, that, that's just extremely small. So let's, let's use this one. Here's another graph very similar to the graph that we were looking at earlier. Adding a component will result in it being used up. Meaning, in their, in their situation, they have used the Haber process and they said they added a little bit of hydrogen to an equilibrium mixture, therefore hydrogen has to be used up. If we're dealing with a reaction that is a forward reaction to create ammonia, then changing something on the left side forces forward reaction to occur. So, adding hydrogen forces the forward reaction. But taking away 
let's say nitrogen forces nitrogen to be replenished. So whatever you do to reestablish equilibrium, the chemical system itself is going to respond. And that is also where we where the, the text and the PowerPoint talks about Q. Q is reaction quotient, which is Q in this case is equal to NH3 squared all over N2 times H2 cubed. Q is at any moment that is not equilibrium, right? So Q is the equilibrium expression, but we're talking about at any moment that's not equilibrium. So what you've done in each of these situations, right, especially right here when you add this H2, is you have now a value of Q, and that value of Q, based on its magnitude, and that goes back to this slide, if Q is going to be less than, we will proceed to the products to make it larger. If Q is greater than, it will go to the reactants to make it smaller. So the adding of H2 increases the denominator, which means that a forward reaction should occur to increase the numerator to reachieve K. Taking away nitrogen makes Q larger than K, therefore it proceeds left to reestablish K. So you gotta just keep, you gotta do a couple of these examples so that you can see that. All right. Now, if we want to talk about delta N for this reaction, what is delta N? Right, delta N is equal to negative two. Okay, because we got 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. Which side of the equation has more gases? More moles of gas, excuse me. Right, the reactants, okay. So when we're talking pressure or a change in volume, which volume and pressure are directly related, right? Or P and V, proportional. They're inversely related, right? P, V. As you change one, you change the other. So, expanding of the vessel, expanding of the container, or making the container smaller, changes volume, which changes pressure. So, when we're dealing with gases, specifically, and a change in volume or pressure, we only are worried about uh, experiments and equations that involve gases. Decreasing the volume increases pressure. So, if you decrease V, you increase P, and when you do those two things, equilibrium shifts towards Lesser moles of gas. Meaning, in this scenario, a decrease in volume and an increase in pressure benefits the forward reaction, which means we're going to push this towards ammonia in this scenario. Because less moles of gas on the product side. And it, it, this, is, this part should be intuitive when it comes to Le Chatelier's principle. If you are decreasing the size of the container to create a better Q, 
which changes everything because concentration now changes as a function of volume, smaller moles of gas. Now, if we increase V and increase, uh, which decreases pressure, then it shifts the other direction. Shift towards more moles of gas. So it will go left in this case. concentration or part of the concentration shifts it for it to be used up or produced. Volume and pressure shift towards lesser or more moles of gas and the change in temperature you need to know delta H. So for delta T you have to know the enthalpy. Right? So if you know enthalpy is indoor exothermic, then temperature impacts you as a reactant or a product. Remember, heat acts like a reactant in an endothermic reaction. In an exothermic, heat acts like a product. So, putting pressure on one side of the equation or the other sends it the other way. Hopefully that is it's really just like a, um, so Haber process is exothermic. So this right here has heat that is produced. So, this process industrially, what do they do for it to happen? They cool the entire vessel. They keep it cool. Because cooling it down takes away heat, causing more products to be made. Taking something away forces it in the direction to replenish. And they say the activation energy is really high. So what they use in industry is they, they cool it down, but they use big time catalysts to create and to get all the hump from a technical standpoint. But for most exothermic reactions, that's what matters. So let's talk about this in uh, relationship to our last question. Making the container smaller for our question involving uh, CF2H2, what does making the container smaller do for us? Shift it which direction? To the left. left. Shift to the left. Why? Because? It's decreasing the volume. Right. Decreasing the volume. And what does decreasing the volume do? Increasing the pressure. Increasing pressure. And therefore, we need to shift the, the reaction in the direction of lesser moles. lesser moles of gas. Yes. All of that together in one shot would be a beautiful explanation for a question like that. Incre decrease the size of the container, decreases volume, increases pressure, shifts the reaction towards lesser moles of gas. Okay? I'm telling you, however, that this particular reaction is endothermic. Therefore, what is the sign of delta H? Endothermic means energy, heat goes in, endo, in. Therefore, the sign should be positive. That's Jenkin 1. And how would you shift the equilibrium, in our case, to the right? So I'm telling you that endothermic means heat is a reactant, effectively. So how do you shift this equilibrium right? Meaning, how do you create more products? Heat it up. You heat it up. Right. Remember, K changes as a function of T as well. Right. K changes as a function of T. So, Heating it up, increasing temperature of the reaction mixture, shifts the reaction to the right. 
but it also changes k and makes k larger or smaller. If t impacts k, in this case, would k be larger or smaller after you heated it up? Yeah, it should be larger, right? Because products over reactants should be larger. Uh, that's the extent of it. I would suggest, now, I'm going back through and checking some of these videos. I realize some of the sound on some of these videos is not that great. Uh, I'm going to try it slowly but surely. This has been a busy week. I'm, I'm involved with a lot of extracurricular stuff, uh, some hiring committees. But I'm going to try to redo some of these videos uh, so that the sound just doesn't bother you because I know the crackling sound is a little terrible. But this is going to be a chapter that you're going to spend time with, right? A lot of y'all are going to leave here today and be like, man, I'm a little shaky. <laughs> Workout Wednesdays, mini lectures um, over this content here. It's going to take spending time with the homework, spending time doing problems, doing different examples of problems making sure that you are comfortable with any scenario that's thrown your way because there's so many different ways to ask equilibrium questions. I suggest that you take a look and look at all the videos and watch them multiple times, look in the textbook, look at some of the examples and problems in the text, uh, and come to me with any questions you have on Wednesday. I would suggest to bring any equilibrium questions from you doing the work on Wednesday. I've been getting a lot of emails about the lab report. Take a look at the sample lab report. I do not expect the lab report showing me all of the numerical data from LabQuest, no. I need a table with just the working up, as we call it, of the data. I just need to see the averaging, I need to see the standard deviation, just like my sample. If you look at my sample, my sample is, is showing you pretty good. Now, you need to make your own graph of the heating, right, or the uh, cooling down. You can make your own graphs, but if there are any specific questions about lab reports, I'll stick around. I can answer those. Um, bring any more that you have on Wednesday. I can take a look and give you some give you some insight uh, before you submit. Pre lab is up. I will go ahead and make sure I got that submitted, so you're not missing the laboratory on Wednesday. But uh, if you got any questions to me about the exam, then feel free to come up and, uh, and ask me those. Otherwise, I will see everybody on Wednesday. Do we have class next Monday? Yeah, we got class. The only day off, they only uh, account for like Easter and Good Friday around here.